Good morning, Majinwa. That's good morning in Irish. Um, how is everyone? Buenos dias. I'm going to read from Heidi. Uh, we are on, gosh, we're getting through it. Look at barely anything left. Mm. Uh, chapter three of part two. Okay, so we're in part two now, chapter three. <clears throat> Consolation. Here's a picture of uh, Heidi. She looks like she's so happy in the grass, <clears throat> in the pasture, maybe. Remember that the doctor is visiting and she was going to take him up on the arm in the pasture. <clears throat> Early the next morning, the doctor climbed the mountain from Dorfley in company with Peter and his goats. He tried several. Krishna, was that you? He tried several times to enter into conversation with the goat boy, but he did not succeed in getting more than the briefest answers to his questions. So they traveled in silence up to the alm hut, where Heidi stood waiting with her two goats. Coming too? asked Peter. Of course, if the doctor will come with us, replied Heidi. Peter looked a little askance at the tall gentleman from Frankfurt. Then the grandfather came out, bringing the dinner bag in his hand. He greeted the doctor, then went to Peter and hung the bag over his shoulder. It was heavier than usual, for the uncle had put in a piece of the dried meat. He thought possibly the doctor might like it up in the pasture. Peter's mouth spread almost from one ear to the other with a grin of satisfaction, for he suspected that there was something unusual inside and he hoped to have some of it. The journey up the mountain began with Heidi surrounded by her goats. Each one wanted to be near her until finally she stood still and said, now please run away. I must go with the doctor a little while now. She patted Shnee Hopley gently on the back, then made her way out of the flock and ran to the side of the doctor. He took her hand and as they climbed, she told him about the birds and the flowers and the remarkable doings of the goats. Meanwhile, Peter had been casting sideways glances at the doctor. These glances might have terrified him, but fortunately, he did not see them. When they reached the end of their journey, Heidi took her kind friend to the loveliest spot of all, and he dropped down beside her on the sunny ground. The autumn sun shone over the peaks and the distant green valley. From the pastures below came the peaceful sound of herd bells. A gentle breeze softly stirred the last bluebells. The robber bird flew in wide circles above them, but today he did not scream. With outspread wings, he seemed to float through the air and take his ease. Heidi's eyes sparkled with delight. She looked at her friend to see if he appreciated how lovely everything was. Yes, Heidi, it is beautiful here, he said. But if one has a sad heart, how can one enjoy this beauty? Oh, oh, exclaimed Heidi quite gaily. Nobody ever has a sad heart here, only in Frankfurt. A smile passed over the doctor's face, but quickly vanished. Then he said, but supposing someone should come and bring his sorrow with him from Frankfurt, do you know of anything that could help him then? He must tell everything to the dear Lord. <clears throat> if he does not know what to do, said Heidi with perfect assurance. Yes, that is a good thought, child, observed the doctor. But if your sorrow comes from him, what can you say to the dear Lord? Heidi had to think what ought to be done in such a case. She was certain that one could obtain help from the dear Lord for every sorrow. She sought a reply from her own experience. Then you must wait, she said, and keep thinking. Surely now the dear Lord knows some joy which is to come out of this by and by. Then all at once you will see quite clearly that the dear Lord had nothing but good in his mind all the time. I don't know if you guys can see these pop-ups on my screen, but I want to get rid of them. They're very distracting. Okay. That is a beautiful faith, and you must hold it fast, said the doctor, gazing down into the green sunlit valley. You see, Heidi, you might sit here with a great shade over your eyes so that you could not take in all the beauty about. Then indeed would your heart be doubly sad, because everything is so beautiful. Can you understand that? Heidi nodded sadly. The doctor's words about a shade over her eyes rem reminded her of the grandmother who could never see again. After a long silence, she said earnestly, yes, indeed, I can understand that. But you must say the grandmother's hymns and they will give you a little light, perhaps so much light that you will become quite happy. What hymns, Heidi? asked the doctor. 
I know only the one about the sun and the beautiful garden and the verses the grandmother likes from the other long one. I always have to read it three times. Say the verses for me, Heidi, said the doctor. Shall I begin where the grandmother says that trust returns to one heart, one's heart? The doctor nodded. Then Heidi began, and this is why it's nice to memorize things and you can just recite it when you need it. Oh, trust his love to guide thee. He is a prince so wise that what his hands provide thee is wondrous in thine eyes. And he, if he be willing, may bring, about, may bring the work about, and thus thy hopes fulfilling, dispel thy fear and doubt. It may be for a season he will no comfort show, and for some hidden reason his light will not bestow. As if no more he heeded what sorrow was thy share, or what relief thou needed in all thy deep despair. But if thy sure faith stays thee, when thou art most perplexed, he will appear and raise thee what time thou least expect'st. He will remove the burden that presses thy heart down, and thou shalt have the garden, and thou shalt wear the crown. Heidi stopped, for she was not sure that the doctor was listening. He had put his hand over his eyes and was sitting motionless. motionless. She thought perhaps he had fallen asleep. But the doctor was not asleep. He had been carried back to the days of long ago when, as a boy, a little boy, he had stood beside his mother's chair. He could almost hear her voice as she sang the hymn that Heidi had just repeated. He sat for a long time with his face buried in his hands. When he finally rose, he noticed that Heidi was looking at him in looks like there's like a, there's like a hole here. It's like, I don't know what that says. Uh, in something meant excitement, expectant meant, anticipation meant. He took the child's hand in his. Heidi, your hymn was beautiful, he said, his voice sounding more cheerful. We will come up here another day and you shall say it for me again. While Heidi was talk, while Heidi talked with the doctor, Peter had been growing more impatient. She had not been up in the pasture for several days. Now that she had come, this old gentleman sat beside her the whole time and she paid no attention to anyone else. This greatly annoyed Peter. He took his place on a slope higher up where the unsuspecting doctor could not see him. He doubled up his fist and shook it. After a while, he doubled up both fists. After a while, oh, the longer Heidi remained sitting beside the doctor, the more frantically Peter shook his fist getting jealous. When the sun stood high in the sky, Peter knew it was time for the midday meal. We must have something to eat, he called. Heidi rose and was going to get the bag so that the doctor could have his dinner just where he was sitting, but he said he was not hungry. He wanted nothing but a glass of milk to drink, and then he would like to climb a little higher on the mountain. Suddenly, Heidi discovered that she was not hungry either, and that she cared for only a glass of milk, too. Then she would like to take the doctor to the moss-covered rock high up where the spicy herbs grew. She ran to Peter and explained that he must first take a bowl of milk from Schwanley for the doctor and another for herself. Who is to have what is in the bag? asked Peter. You may have it, but you must get the milk first and be quick about it, was Heidi's reply. Peter had never done anything in his life so quickly as he accomplished this task. As soon as Heidi and the doctor had drunk their milk, he opened the bag. When he saw the big piece of meat, his whole body trembled with delight. He put in his hand, then suddenly drew it back as though he dared not take such a wonderful present. He remembered how he had shaken his fist at the doctor and this kept him from enjoying the, the dinner the doctor had given him. He jumped up and ran back to the place where he had been standing, stretched both hands wide open up in the air as a sign that his clenched fists had meant nothing. He remained standing there for some time until he felt that his deed was atoned for. Then he took great leaps back to the bag. Now that his conscience was clear, he could enjoy his nice dinner. The doctor and Heidi wandered about together for a long time. When he decided that it was time for him to go back, Heidi insisted on walking with him as far as her grandfather's hut. She went hand in hand with her friend, and on the way she had a great deal to show him. She wanted him to see the places where the goats liked best to feed 
and where grew the greatest number of yellow wild roses and red centuries and other flowers to be found in the summertime. She knew them all, for her grandfather had taught her their names. But at last the doctor said he must go. They bade each other good night, and as he went down the mountain, he turned every little while to look back. He saw Heidi standing in the same place, waving her hand to him, just so his own dear little daughter had waved when he went away from his house. It was a clear, sunny autumn month. Every morning the doctor came up on the mountain. Often he went off with the Aum uncle far up into the craggy mountains where the old weather-beaten fir trees grew. The great robber bird must have had his nest nearby, for he often whizzed past, worrying and croaking. The doctor took great pleasure in his companion's society and was amazed to see how familiar the uncle was with all the plants on his mountain and how well he knew what they were good for. The old man was equally familiar with the life and plant, the life and habits of the, oh my gosh, the life and habits of the animals up there, both big and small. <laughs> he had very amusing things to tell the doctor about the ways of the little creatures living in holes in the rocks, in caves, and even in the branches of the lofty firs. The doctor did not know where the time went on these excursions, and often at evening, when he shook his uncle's, when he shook the uncle's hand at parting, he would say, my good friend, I never go away from you without having learned something new. But usually the doctor chose to go with Heidi. They would sit together on the lovely cliff where they had sat the first day, and Heidi repeated her hymns. Peter would sit behind them in his place, but he was now quite peaceable and no longer shook his fists at them. At last, the doctor had to return to Frankfurt. The parting grieved him, for he loved the mountain like his home. Heidi had become so used to seeing him every day that it was hard for her to realize his visit was coming to an end. The doctor bade her grandfather farewell, then asked her to walk with him a little way. Hand in hand, they started down the mountain. Finally, the doctor stood still. Heidi had come far enough, he said, and must turn back. He laid his hand tenderly on her curly hair. I must go, Heidi, he said. If only I could take you to Frankfurt and keep you with me. A shadow passed over Heidi's face as she remembered Frankfurt with its many, many houses and stony streets. She thought of Fraulein Rottenmeier and Tanette, and she answered timidly, I would rather have you come back to us again. Well, yes, that would be better. So goodbye, said the doctor, holding out his hand. When Heidi looked up at him, she saw that the kind eyes had filled with tears. Then he turned away and hurried down the mountain. Heidi remained standing where he had left her. The sight of his tears had gone straight to her heart. Suddenly she burst into loud weeping and rushed after him. Doctor, doctor, she called. He turned around and waited until she reached him. Aw, the tears were streaming down her cheeks. I will go with you to Frankfurt now, and I will stay with you as long as you like, but I must hurry back to tell my grandfather. No, my dear Heidi, he said kindly, not now. You must stay under the fir trees, for you might be sick again if you went with me. But I want to ask you something. If I am ever sick and alone, will you come then and stay with me? Can I think that someone will care for me and love me? Yes, yes, then I will surely come to you the very same day, and I love you almost as well as my grandfather, said Heidi decidedly. The doctor pressed her hand once more and hurried on his way, but Heidi remained standing in the same spot, waving until he seemed like a mere speck in the distance. When he turned around for the last time to look back at her, he said softly to himself, it is good to be on the mountain. Body and soul get well, and life is happy again. We're going to stop there. Very interesting. I was a little worried she was going to go back to Frankfurt with him and be all unhappy again. It's good to know what makes you happy and to stick with it. Even if other people want to take you with them because you're happy and then they think that you being happy is going to make them happy, but nobody can make anybody else happy. You have to make yourself happy. Remember that. All right. Have a good day.